campus community, we welcome you to Massachusetts Maritime Academy. My name is Elizabeth Simmons, and I'm our Vice President for External Affairs. It's such an honor to host the New England Governors and Eastern Canadian Premiers Conference as one of nine state universities in the Commonwealth and one of six state maritime academies. We take pride in producing the next generation of mariners through a world-class education that provides a high return on investment. At the Academy, we're deeply committed to the future of renewable and sustainable energy. We look forward to showing you many of our campus-wide projects and initiatives, specifically those focusing on offshore wind that are not only being incorporated into our undergraduate programs, but also the opportunities that we're providing training and developing a qualified offshore wind workforce. It's my pleasure to welcome her back to campus, this time as governor, Governor Healy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Captain. Well, good morning, and thank you, Captain Simmons. It's, uh, it's great to be on campus. I, I uh, want to thank you, the entire team at Mass Maritime Academy, our cadets, uh, who many of whom will, uh, will be showing us around in just a little bit. But this is a special place, um, as you can see, just looking out, right? It's really it's a good way to start a Monday. Um, but it's a real jewel for Massachusetts, and uh, I really appreciate what it, what it provides, not only in terms of higher education, but also the, the training and the job skills, uh, the workforce. Um, as governor of Massachusetts, of course, I'm very interested in making sure that our folks stay here in Massachusetts after, after graduation. But I know whether you go to one of our other terrific New England stakes or any of our Canadian provinces, um, you, will be, uh, you will be doing great, great work. So uh, welcome, to, uh, welcome to campus. We thought this was an appropriate place to begin given Massachusetts' particular seafaring history and, and heritage um, combined with our uh, unrelenting desire for innovation. That's been part of our DNA, too, the last couple hundred years. We, I get in a fight with, with our governors in, in, in Pennsylvania and Virginia um, boasting that Massachusetts is actually home to American democracy, and this is where that little old revolution all kicked off. Uh, which we will celebrate next year, 250 years. So good morning to all of you, especially uh, to, uh, to my colleagues. I, I know we're, you know, it's special when we have a chance to work uh, together, um, uh, particularly, you know, across our country's uh, borders. It's, it's really important. I think that all of the challenges that we're confronted with today um, really require that kind of collaboration and that kind of problem solving. And that certainly is something that this group has been about for 45 years strong, as this is the new 45th New England Governors, Eastern Newfoundland and Labrador, who will be hosting us next year. I look forward to, to, to that conference as well. I also know from speaking with him that Newfoundland and Labrador is home to its own maritime university, the Memorial University Mar Marine Institute, which plays a very similar role to the role that Mass Maritime plays here, and another example of our shared culture. I appreciate all of the Canadian leaders and their representatives who've made the trip south to join us here in Massachusetts. Uh, Premier King of uh, Prince Edward Island is here. Good morning. Uh, Minister, <laughs> Minister Biron of Quebec is here. Welcome to the Quebec delegation. Associate Deputy Minister McGregor of Nova Scotia. Good morning. Executive Director Bro of New Brunswick. My fellow New England governors and their staffs, Governor Phil Scott from the great state of Vermont is here. <laughs> Governor Janet Mills of the great state of Maine is here. <laughs> and joining us along with their teams will have Governor Ned Lamont from Connecticut and Governor Dan McKee from Rhode Island. I also am grateful to see so many from our state legislature here in Massachusetts who provide so much of the funding that we're able to benefit from, including this great institution, 
and also help set the agenda, uh, particularly on issues of, of clean energy and some of the work we're going to be discussing in the next couple of days. So we have with us uh, Senator Sue Moran from this district, uh, Representative Sarah Peek, Representative Flanagan, and Representative Zaros. So this is a great conference. It's been going on for a number of years, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And we look forward over the next couple of days to strengthening the bonds between the New England states and our Eastern Canadian provinces as we address shared challenges and forge cooperative solutions. And I always talk about challenges as opportunities, and I think the moment we're in, while challenging, does present an opportunity. And it's through the work of the teams in this room that I know so much is going to be possible uh, for the greater Northeast. We're eager to share some of the ways that here in Massachusetts we're looking to lead on clean energy to benefit our residents, our economies, and of course our climate. And today we'll have the opportunity to tour some really world-class facilities that are critical to our success in offshore wind. Offshore wind, its supply chain, and the clean energy transition present an enormous opportunity not only to combat climate change, but also an opportunity to spur economic growth. We're seizing that opportunity here in Massachusetts in collaboration with our fellow New England states and also with the Biden-Harris administration. Off the coast, not too far from here, is America's first utility-scale offshore wind farm, Vineyard Wind. And just last week, we were proud to join with Rhode Island in selecting major projects for our next step forward, which total close to 2,900 megawatts of wind power. Where's Rhode Island? Thank you. It's going to be great. It's going to be great because it has the potential to power 1.6 million homes and, importantly, create 10,000 new great jobs. And as we transition to our clean energy future, we're working to ensure that these jobs are all high quality jobs, high paying, that strengthen our middle class and bring opportunity to environmental justice communities. The United States Department of Energy just last month reported that clean energy jobs are growing at twice the rate of the rest of the economy. I'm gonna say that again. Clean energy jobs in America are growing at twice the rate as other jobs. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the economic opportunity that is in front of us. And importantly, for the first time, the unionization rate of clean energy has surpassed that of the energy sector as a whole. I'll say that again, the unionization rate within this sector is growing faster than the rest of the jobs in the energy sector. That's a good thing. It's a great thing because our labor unions are critical partners to ensuring that we have the skilled workforce to meet this moment. And I am so delighted, you'll hear from a few in just a moment, um, that we are joined today by champions for working people in Massachusetts, our president of the Massachusetts AFL-CIO, Chrissy Lynch, <laughs> and President Frank Callahan of the Massachusetts Building Trades. We also have other labor leaders among us who they will acknowledge shortly. Again, thank you all for being here and the work of your members. Um, before I turn it over to Chrissy and Frank, um, I just want to say again how delighted I am that everybody made it to Massachusetts. We hope to have a fun-filled couple of days, a learning-filled couple of days, and most importantly, a couple of days of real collaboration and conversation about what we can do to help our states to help our provinces move forward. I really believe that it's those who put their heads together and do the work right now, thinking through some of the challenges um, and thinking through solutions, you know, that whoever does that well first is, is gonna win this and win this big. And it will redound to the benefit of all of our residents in, in all of our jurisdictions. So thank you all for your time this morning. 
And with that, I'll turn it over to Chrissy and to Frank. Thank you very much, uh, Governor, for the very nice uh, intro and for the support your administration has consistently had for working people on this and so many other issues. Good morning and thank you to all the union leaders and staff and allies in the room. Um, we appreciate you. Um, my name is Chrissy Lynch. I am very proud um, to represent over 800 local unions and nearly half a million working people from just about every sector of our Commonwealth and every corner of our Commonwealth, um, including thousands of people who operate our traditional energy sources that have lit and heated and homed our offices and our schools and our hospitals and our community centers for generations, also including thousands of people who are ready to build, repair, and maintain our climate resilient infrastructure and our energy efficient infrastructure. Look, the labor movement is already on the forefront of this latest renewable energy work and we are ready to take on more. Our apprenticeship training centers are the best in the industry. They're the most up to date, the safest, the most diverse. Our apprentices earn while they learn, giving them the economic stability to invest in our local communities to stay in Massachusetts. Um, look, organized labor is committed to figuring out the right solutions for workers, for communities, for our shared environment, but we need to be intentional to make sure that green jobs don't lower job standards for all workers. We need to be intentional to make sure that green jobs are union jobs that actually raise standards for all working people because we want to be growing and diversifying the middle class as we fight climate change. And we're really grateful that Biden-Harris administration, like the Healy administration, has been such an incredible partner here in ensuring that investments in decarbonization also support good union jobs. But look, we know it takes a team. And just like I know our governors have been doing, the Massachusetts AFL-CIO and our climate arm have been working in very close collaboration with our counterparts in Rhode Island, in Connecticut, in New York, and in Maine. We are very proud of the team we've got here in the Northeast. Um, we want to make sure that our region leads the country in responsible offshore wind development. Um, a critical part of that team is Frank Callahan, the, pre the president of the Mass Building Trades Union. So I'm going to give it over to you, Frank. Thanks, Chrissy. Thank you, Governor Healy, members of the legislature, uh, New England governors, and the premiers from uh, brothers and sisters to the north. Uh, my name is Frank Callahan. I'm president of Massachusetts Building Trades Unions. I'm proud to be able to represent more than 75,000 men and women who work every day in the construction industry, including our emerging industry of offshore wind. We've been at this for quite some time. Uh, we recognized the need not just to provide and train the workforce to do that to accomplish these new technology, green technology jobs, but also the other work that would come. Uh, we go back to the days of Cape Wind, I'm sure some of you may recall. I just had a meeting last week with Senator Markey's office because in addition to the jobs everybody thinks of offshore wind is sticking the turbines in the ocean floor and running the cable and powering our homes, which it certainly is, but there's much more. We had a meeting for the the manufacturing and the supply chain that the governor referenced for Prismian to manufacture cable. Uh, and this all began under uh, past Governor Deval Patrick when we had the first project labor agreement in New Bedford to build the foundation, literally the foundation, to support this industry with the uh, New Bedford Marine Terminal, which is now being used by Vineyard Wind for the first uh, utility scale offshore wind farm. We've worked with our brothers and sisters in the North Shore with uh, Crowley Engineering to build a similar facility there, and we're continuing on uh, having meetings and, again, making sure that these jobs are good, family-sustaining union jobs so people can be contributing members to our economy, as careers, as the governor and I often talk about, not simply jobs. Uh, it's important because traditionally when a new industry emerges, the old ones, which we are more established in for those union jobs, goes away. And we struck. We were ahead of the curve with our friends like the governor, our friends in the legislature, and uh, past governor Deval Patrick to make sure that those jobs are going to be union jobs early, right away. So we're not just discarding the existing union workforce and then replacing them with a low-wage, low-skilled workforce, and then taking years, if not decades, to catch up. This is we're ahead of the curve. I appreciate all your efforts, Madam Governor, and to many other people in this room. 
And we're looking forward to more of these projects as were announced last week and putting our members to work. And I'll leave you with one tidbit. Uh, early on in our conversations with Vineyard Wind, there was some jockeying. They didn't quite understand how we work in the United States. Chrissy mentioned our apprenticeship programs, which you'll hear more about at lunch today. They've been so impressed with our workforce. There are now four Massachusetts residents working off the coast of Scotland. So we're not just exporting uh, uh, other things in this country. We're exporting our workers and their expertise that they bring to the job because they recognize the value of our training, the skill, and our work ethic. And we're hoping to expand that up and down the East Coast. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm okay with the, that kind of export. That's all right. <laughs> um, look, I, 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 um, I want to uh, also say that you, know, you mentioned the project labor agreements. Those three big wind projects that we just announced last week with Rhode Island, 2,900 megawatts, those three projects include project labor agreements. So you can uh, support uh, a workforce and great careers and uh, grow a great economy in this important, important sector all at the same time. We're going to show how to, how to do it with these projects. Um, I'd now like to turn it over to another critical person in our workforce development and an offshore wind expert. We are very lucky to have him. He's um, he's here in, in Massachusetts at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he is a professor of civil and environmental engineering. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Awadi is um, a leading member of the faculty at the UMass Wind Energy Center. This is pretty special. Um, University of Massachusetts has the nation's leading center on wind. It's, um, it's, a, it's a center for research and education in this sector. It was selected by the Federal Department of Energy earlier this year to establish and lead America's Academic Center for Reliability and Resilience of Offshore Wind, or ARO. We're so proud to be a state that pro both produces the ideas and the applications in this field that are so critical to our clean energy future. And we are grateful to have Dr. Awadi with us this morning to give us a brief primer on offshore wind and to set the scene for today's experience. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Healy, for the introduction and especially for the invitation to come and speak to this group this morning. And good morning, New England, and good morning to our Canadian friends and neighbors. Bonjour, uh, nos amis et voisins canadiens. Um, the idea of offshore wind actually started right here in Massachusetts, about two hours west of where we're sitting right now in Amherst. Bill Hieronymus was a captain in the Navy, retired, and then a professor of ocean engineering at UMass Amherst, and conceived of the idea of harvesting energy from the winds offshore. His ideas seemed outlandish at the time. The illustration, hand-drawn illustration to the left, looks pretty far out, even here in 2024. But the ideas that he conceived of actually formed the basis for what happened in Northern Europe and what is happening now off the coast of the Eastern United States. Since then, as Governor Healy referred to, Massachusetts has been home to the most comprehensive wind energy and offshore wind education and research in the country. Uh, at UMass Amherst, the Wind Energy Center has been for more than 50 years educating hundreds of professionals who went out into the field and in many cases formed companies that became the basis of the North American wind energy industry. For a very brief period of time, we think it was a couple of weeks, Amherst was home to the largest wind turbine in the world back in the, I think, late 70s or something like that. Uh, and of course, as the industry has grown, other institutions throughout Massachusetts, our community colleges, our academies, other um, four-year and graduate universities have joined uh, the efforts to advance wind and offshore wind throughout the country and the world. Um, New England, as was referred to, is, the home, is home to the first commercial utility-scale wind farm in North America. Um, Rhode Island is home to Block Island as well. Uh, let's see, there's Block Island, right? And um, 
I have a colleague who had the privilege of taking a tour of Block Island. It was on a windy day like it is today. And let's say that the sea state didn't agree very well with him, but the view of the turbines certainly did. Uh, and then in Maine, uh, some of the early research that is supporting the advent of floating offshore wind in the deeper waters of the Gulf of Maine, but also laying the foundation for development that will go on in the Pacific off the coasts of California, Oregon, and Hawaii. <clears throat> uh, I'll mention Rhode Island in one other way, which is that in prelude to um, the Block Island development, Rhode Island participated, organized, and led the production of a special area management plan, what at the time was really a new approach to thinking about and designing the use of ocean resources. And it was critical, that process, to bringing stakeholders into the process early and making sure that everyone felt heard and valued in the move towards the development of the Block Island farm. Um, and of course, Vineyard Win One is happening right now. It was a great moment for all of us who are interested in renewable energy when Vineyard Win One delivered power to the grid for the first time. Um, and as I've learned more about the project, bringing our Arrow Center uh, along to, to start up, I've learned about the success of their relations with organized labor and also the success of their relations with um, indigenous tribes, with tribal nations through their tribal benefits agreement, the first signed, as, as, I'm far, as far as I'm aware, by any offshore wind development project. Since I started working in offshore wind uh, over a decade ago, it's often been said that, well, Europe is where the real technology is, and Europe is where they kind of know how to do this already. Um, this is a map of uh, projects at different stages of development throughout northern Europe. There's a lot, and there's no doubt that we have a lot to learn from Europe. Um, Europe still represents about 45% of global offshore wind deployment. Um, they have just recently dropped below 50% as Asia has taken the reins on very, very rapid deployment and development of offshore wind. But notwithstanding what's to be learned from Europe, we have a lot to do here on our own in the eastern United States and in eastern Canada. We have to assess and mitigate the potential for impacts of hurricanes and other kinds of major winter storms on what are going to be these massive offshore power plants. We have to think about and develop and invent new kinds of foundations that will keep the machines up in the air, generating electricity in all kinds of conditions. Uh, for our neighbors to the north, we have to think about what it would mean and how it would work to deploy offshore renewable energy in an environment where sea icing occurs. Uh, and we also have to work on the um, development of a domestic, regional, continental supply chain that can locally support development, renewable energy, but also support the kinds of good jobs that both of our countries need. And lastly, we have special installation challenges here off the coast of the Northeast of Northeast North America that don't exist in Europe. So while we have lots to learn from Europe, we have lots to do on our own here in North America. The state of the industry in North America and the United States continues to be dynamic and forward-looking. Our federal government maintains its target of 86 gigawatts of offshore wind installation by 2050, an incredibly ambitious but I think attainable goal. State targets, as Governor Healy referred to, are high and growing, with Massachusetts having um, 5,600 megawatts, Connecticut 2,000, and Rhode Island at least a gigawatt of authorized procurement. Uh, and those numbers continue to grow on a really almost on a daily basis. Um, those kinds of initiatives, both from the federal level and from the state and regional level, are a signal to the industry and to those of us working in education, research, and workforce development that government is serious about the transition to renewable energy and that government is going to play its role in incentivizing, supporting, and facilitating the kind of growth that we need in this industry. <clears throat> Maine is also, and through, largely through the University of Maine and its outstanding wind energy center, is providing a proving ground and possible commercial home for offshore floating wind in the United States. Participation of Canada is very much on the, uh, uh, on the drawing board with, as far as I'm aware, and for example, projects being eyed off the coast of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and Labrador, and Quebec with its industrial and transportation infrastructures certainly needing to be a part of a regional effective supply chain as we move forward. And finally, and more from my perspective in academia and at the university, at the universities, academia continues to gear up research and innovation initiatives that are going to support 
the offshore wind industry and the ocean renewable energy industry as it continues to develop in eastern North America and eventually serves millions and millions of homes and commercial users throughout our region. Some examples of that um, are the main showed one of their demonstration projects. This is an experimental facility at the University of Maine for combined wind and wave testing of floating offshore platforms. The Arrow Center that Governor Healy mentioned, Governor Healy mentioned at UMass Amherst is a tremendous win for the Commonwealth and for UMass Amherst. We are going to be the first federally funded university-led education and research center in offshore wind in the country. And you'll see at the bottom, the Department of Energy is highlighted, but equally, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center is highlighted. So truly, without the support of the Healy administration, both political but also significant financial support, really one-to-one -one dollar matching of the federal money, uh, I really don't believe that UMass Amherst or Massachusetts could have competed effectively at the federal level. But we did, and we won. And this center is going to be based here in Massachusetts with part participation from other states, and over the course of its five-year run is going to touch thousands of students at the post-secondary level who are eventually going to enter the workforce, the offshore wind workforce. So thank you very sincerely to all of the parts of Massachusetts government, from the executive office to the Clean Energy Center to DOER, who um, showed their support for Massachusetts universities in pursuing this center. Um, and we're going to deliver over the course of the next five years. There are some technology issues that I think are worth, worth touching on briefly. Um, the scale of these machines is, is hard to fathom. So we look out the window and we see a, a really nice wind turbine. I believe if I have my numbers right, that's about 660 watts of, uh, kilowatts of generating capacity. Um, as turbines have grown, you'll see on the right, I think, is that 17? Yeah. So on the right is a turbine with 17 megawatts of capacity, so some 30 times as large in terms of electrical generating capacity as the turbine we see over there. Each one of the turbines being built now and in the coming years is going to be as tall from the bottom of the sea to the top of the rotor as some of the tallest human-made structures on the planet, and we're going to erect thousands of them out in the ocean. The technology challenges are real. Something that's interesting that I think is worth uh, knowing about is that in this race for bigger and bigger machines, there's a tension. The developers like big machines, more power, more revenue. The manufacturers of the turbines, General Electric, Vestas, Siemens, and others, they would love a little bit of time to develop, market, and sell a sort of standard turbine. So as in all things, the sort of machinations of the market will bring conclusion to this tension between the developers and the turbine manufacturers. But it's something that will affect what size turbines get deployed and how much power is generated from our offshore winds. We're going to need new kinds of foundations. When I refer to foundations, I effectively refer to the stuff below the waterline. There are certain conditions off the coast of, the, uh, of eastern North America that are different from what they are in Europe. Wave conditions, sea icing conditions, geotechnical conditions at the bottom of the ocean. And so we at the universities and industry are working hard to develop new kinds of solutions to, as I like to say as a civil engineer, keep the machine up in the air generating electricity. And then lastly, when we look at this map of the eastern United States, right, we see that offshore wind is going to be a system, an infrastructure system made of thousands of huge structures spread across hundreds of miles of ocean. And the need for a coordinated and effective transmission grid is going to be absolutely crucial to effectively and economically delivering power to users. So I'm going to sort of wrap up by um, uh, leaving us on this slide and just commenting on my view of the offshore wind industry and uh, sector as someone who's a civil engineer. And what civil engineers do is design and build large-scale infrastructure systems. Um, we're faced with really a unique opportunity with offshore wind here, the chance to build, design and build and manage from essentially zero a brand new distributed and huge infrastructure system from the ground up. This is a tremendous opportunity, and we have an opportunity to do it right and to learn from earlier attempts at building such infrastructure systems, the interstate highway system, railroad networks, onshore transmission networks, water supply distribution networks, right? In all of those cases, things have been done in different ways, and there have been 
mistakes made and there have been successes. So as we think about offshore wind, I encourage us not to think about just the machine sitting at the top of the pole or just the cable bringing power to land, but to think of it as a truly integrated infrastructure system, one that includes not just the sort of hard goods of the machines and structures, but also the people, the people that will build those systems, that will design those systems, and that will benefit from the system and also share the burdens. We have an opportunity to do the development of offshore wind in a way that is equitable and shares those burdens and benefits amongst all of the communities of our states, provinces, and countries. It's really an exciting time to be involved in offshore wind, I think, because, not in spite of, the hard work that is needed to bring a clean and renewable energy future to the United States, to Canada, and to the globe. Thanks again for inviting me to speak today. I'd be happy to talk more in any informal times we have or over lunch, uh, but it's been a privilege to speak to you, and uh, I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations and comments over the rest of the morning. Thank you again, Governor Healy. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Dr. Awadi. Uh, we certainly appreciate the background that you've provided um, on, on offshore wind. I'm Bridget Pavlonis. I'm Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs here at Massachusetts Maritime, and I'm incredibly excited uh, to be here with you today uh, for this meeting of the New England Governors and Eastern Canadian Premiers. Um, and Governor Healy, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, we are honored uh, to have this meeting uh, held and to be able to sponsor this 2024 conference. Since its inception in 1891, Massachusetts Maritime Academy has not only fulfilled its promise to the nation and our commonwealth of training future mariners to safely operate on our oceans, but our academy has capitalized on the new technologies uh, first on sailing ships, that was the original wind to energy, um, to steam and gas turbines, and now to renewable energy, and interestingly, back to wind. In 2019, our academy launched our first global wind organization training. It was the first of its kind in the nation. We coupled maritime training uh, with the standardized GWO training, and, and we have a really cool video that's about to come. It's a little too early, though. Um, and ensuring those who work on those wind towers and, and on our seas are prepared to do that work safely. Through a partnership with Rely on New Tech, our Maritime Center for Responsible Energy, now five years later, is still doing that same training. We have people, we have workers coming back um, for their re recertification training and basic safety training and basic technical training to ensure that they can safely perform these functions. But we haven't done all of this on our own. We are incredibly fortunate uh, to, receive, to have been the recipient of a generous grant from the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and to, ma to make this all possible. And I'm really super excited that under the Governor Healy administration, we are now uh, prepared to receive our keeping pace in a constantly evolving industry. Massachusetts Maritime Academy is the future home of the Helicopter Underwater Escape Training, or Hewitt Training, that will be held in our pool. This training is going to allow workers to now move through the air to those offshore wind towers and further minimize the impact on our waters and protect our marine mammals. In the past five years, Massachusetts Maritime has trained nearly 1,000 global wind organization workers, many of whom are working off-site as we speak uh, in the waters just off the coast of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. As a result, we have developed incredibly close relationships with the pile drivers and mill rights unions, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers unions, um, and in a very, very proud recent moment, we've developed a partnership with the New Bedford Ocean Cluster. 
this has been very important for us uh, because what it's allowed us to do is identify workforce opportunities for un unemployed or underemployed individuals and create pathways for folks in our commonwealth, especially on the south coast, to enter the offshore wind field. In addition to benefits to the workforce, the Academy's focus on offshore wind extends to our undergraduate program as well. We have college students, some of whom are standing uh, along uh, this right side of the room, who are engaged in clean energy capstone design pro projects. We have students taking an offshore wind and policy course, and we have some engaged in summer cooperative edu education learning programs. Um, we have another group who have just completed an experiential learning, um, which, which was an opportunity in offshore wind. And during that tour today, I really do, do hope you'll take the time to engage not only with them, um, with also a couple of our professors, Professors Pandy and Taft, who are here uh, to talk you through the work that we've been doing on our campus. So in just a few minutes, uh, we're going to break into three groups, and we'll take a walk around our, our beautiful campus. And as we leave here, our first walk, I, I ask you to please take note. Uh, we, uh, um, along our Academy's Energy Corridor, it highlights our long-established commitment to eco-consciousness and sustainability right here on our campus. It'll give you a glimpse of the Commonwealth's first ever wind turbine. You can see it right outside this window. And the Commonwealth's first ever LEED Platinum certified building, proudly hosted here on our Academy's campus. Our tour will allow you to engage with our full mission bridge simulator. Um, Senator Moran, I was having a chit chat with her before we started. She said it's like a giant Xbox, so I hope you have fun with it. Uh, we have a vessel navigating through an offshore wind field, and you'll see some of the challenges that that presents. You'll be able to observe trainers working at heights on tower ladders. Um, we have a couple of folks from our MCRE, our Maritime Center for Responsible Energy, uh, Captain Flannery, Commander Baum, who will be there working with you on that. And then finally, to watch a vessel approach a rep replicated offshore wind tower on a pier. Uh, it is a little windy out there, so hold on to your hats. Make sure you're wrapped up warm. But we have a, a cool program, I think, arranged for you. Before we head out to those three uh, different stations, I'd like to show you now a brief video of what it is you're going to see. It features our very own director of Mar Here at Massachusetts Maritime Academy, we've been training people to work offshore since 1891. And we were excited to be able to apply that experience to the offshore wind industry as it grows in the United States. We offer that training right here on Buzzards Bay, uh, out on the open water, with the wind in your face, off of a real vessel. For offshore wind, the GWO training standard consists of five modules. Working at heights, first aid, fire awareness, manual handling, and what makes it specific to offshore wind is the sea survival module. We're teaching them skills that we hope that they never have to use in a controlled environment where they can practice until they get it right. We've partnered with Rely on New Tech, which is the largest provider of global GWO training throughout the world, which allows us to provide that globally recognized training in three days versus five days anyway. In addition to that, we have excellent facilities, very experienced instructors, and our training has been overwhelmingly positive, not only from the course participants, but from their employers. And that's validated by the fact that they continue to send more and more and more of their employees to Mass Maritime GWO training. So 
So thanks so much. Uh, I'd now like to ask, we're going to go ahead and break into those three groups that we had talked about. I, I'm going to ask that uh, Captain Simmons and Captain Burns uh, take lead of the first group with uh, Governor Healy and uh, other uh, premiers and governors. Ms. Mulholland, uh, Mary Allen, do I see you? Mary Allen and Captain Pandy, where are you? Okay, Professor Pandy will lead group two to the working at heights. So group one, we're gonna go ahead and start at the bridge sim. Group two, uh, we're gonna start at working at heights. And Professor Taft, are you here? Professor Taft uh, and Commander Fahm will lead group three, group three to the tower transfer on the pier. So enjoy the tour, 